<laughs> Perfect timing, just come in. Yeah, hi everybody to one of the first sessions of the Informatic Festival 2024. I'm glad to see that there's some interest in your own chat data and what can tell about you. So maybe let me start with a question. So do you use any of the following messengers? So Facebook Messenger, anyone? No, no, online audience, no. Okay, what about WhatsApp? Who of you uses WhatsApp? Okay, there's a few shows of hands. Everybody in the audience in the room. And then there's also Instagram Messenger. How about that one? Two knots, a maybe. Okay. So um, who of you knows that you can request your own data from these platforms? Yeah, there's also a few shows of hands. Okay, um, that will be the basis for today's workshop. So um, let me start with an agenda before we get into the details. So first I'll do a short introduction of the speakers and then I'll present our research group and what we do. And um, then I'll talk about why we're actually interested in chat metadata and what we hope to learn from it. So then you will also have the, sorry. Then you will also have the opportunity to either explore your own chat metadata as part of an online study that we also conduct at the Bielefeld University, or you can explore um, general insights with demo chat data that we can provide for you. And then there will be a break afterwards, and we'll have time for discussing um, more in-depth questions and our future plans for um, more insights. Okay, so let's get started with the introductions. So my name is Florian Martin. I have a background in computer science from the University of Tübingen. And I've worked as a software developer and some med tech stuff. Oh, sorry. I think we have to pause for a moment um, as the connection on my laptop is unfortunately not that stable. It might happen from time to time. But I think we can live with that. Okay, and we're back. Um, sorry for that. So yeah, um, I've been working as a software developer for some medtech startup, and uh, right now I'm doing a PhD. Um, first I started at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam. Now I'm working at the University of Bielefeld, and I'm interested in social interactions. And with me here is Leonard Krause, who is currently doing his master's in psychology and who is taking care of our online crowd today. Um, and you will also be happy to answer questions later on for the analysis part. Um, also, he might take, actually, no, you're probably not uh, taking photos today. <laughs> um, yeah, let's get on with the introduction of the group. So um, we are part of the Multimodal Behavior Processing Group for Human-Centered AI. And this is our team led by Professor Hannah Dremala, who you can see to the left of the picture. And broadly speaking, our research sits at the intersection of psychology and um, computer science. And we are interested in different aspects of human behavior, how it can be made measurable for machines and how that can in order uh, like eventually benefit us humans again. Or if you will, um, we want to answer questions in psychology with methods of computer science. And accordingly, we have very diverse backgrounds in our team. So there's computer science, there's psychology, medicine, neuroscience, physics, all that to support our interdisciplinary research. And now what we are actually doing, I'll just give a short brief overview um, of our um, projects. So for example, there is one concerned with the induction and measurement of stress via a digital smartphone app. Um, we are also doing research on extracting heart rate data um, from videos, which is also linked to stress. And then there's projects focusing in, on analyzing voice, uh, facial motions, and gaze behavior. So for example, this is um, relevant in supporting diagnostics for psychological conditions related to social interactions, for example, social anxiety or autism spectrum disorder. And we are also interested in what signals people give to show that they understand something or are confused by it um, and how these signals can be used to improve explainable AI. So these signals, for example, are nodding for understanding or like cocking your head and frowning for something that's confusing. Yeah, and all of these projects I can talk about more after the break if you're interested. So just feel free to ask. 
And yeah, in my personal project, I focus on social interactions. So to get an idea what that is about, let's start with a little experiment. So um, yeah, I'm delayed by one. So um, I would like you to participate in this short poll. I'll also take a moment to answer the question there. Um, this, uh, this poll will ask you about how many people you think you know and just don't think about it too much, give a rough estimate. Um, and Leo, maybe you can send the link in the online chat. Perfect. Yeah, I'll also take a moment to participate. Okay, so I think that will be the votes. Okay, and these are the results. So let's see what we all voted. Oh, wow. A lot of people voted, the majority voted that they know more than 250 persons. I would not have expected that. Um, okay, but let's get into the reason why I was asking this. So um, there's quite extensive research on um, trying to estimate something called social capacity. Um, there are different definitions, but um, it breaks down to how many people you can keep in contact with. And there's this British anthropologist, Robin Dunbar, who proposed an interesting approach to this question that later became known as Dunbar's number. Uh, so he was looking at different species of primates and found a strong correlation between the size of their new cortex and um, the communities that they form. So the size of how many people they know in that sense. And he was wondering, so hmm, does this translate to humans? So he looked at the human brain sizes and pr predicted um, that humans should form communities of about 150 people. So <laughs> in our small and very scientifically valid study that we just did right now, um, we found that um, apparently we know more people than 250. And so actually also in newer studies, it turned out that there is um, much individual variance in trying to um, in that single number. So um, this is not valid for everyone. And um, the variance is so big that trying to post this number is essentially meaningless. But while all this research on social capacity is very interesting, it also suffers from another huge problem. Um, so if you've thought about what even is a meaningful interaction, you already got the issue. So in one study, um, Dunbar defined this as the number of people that you would send a Christmas card to. I'm not sure whether that's the best approach, but um, I think that's a relic of that time. And we think we have a better approach at um, objectively measuring social interactions. And so as a big share of our um, social interactions nowadays take place online, um, why not use chat data as a proxy? So this is what we did. And um, essentially, we are asking people to anonymously donate um, their chat data. So for this, we developed Donor, which is a platform that works like this. So first, participants need to obtain their data. So from Facebook and Instagram, they have to request them and wait for the platform to make the data available as a download. So this is only possible thanks to the GDPR. And still, sometimes participants have to wait for more than a day while on WhatsApp, um, participants can export their chats um, instantaneously in the app, but only one by one, since apparently it's too hard for Meta to implement a multiple selection. So this is the reason why we only ask for five to seven chats and then the most relevant ones. So the ones where people, um, or the, the people that um, you as a donor might share important live events mm. with. And yeah, detailed instructions on how this um, works can be found on our website. And then you can use the same website 
to also anonymize the data. And this already happens client side. So via JavaScript in the background. So none of the raw chat data is ever submitted over the web. And um, yeah, the anonymization works like this. So the names and phone numbers, so the contacts are replaced by an ID and the content of the message is replaced by a word count or for audio messages by the length of the message. And in the end, we then only have the pseudonyms for the, um, the participants. So who sent the message, who received the message. Um, we have the timestamps. We have like a flag, whether it was a group chat or a one-on-one -on -one chat. And um, yeah, the, the length. And yeah, media like pictures, or sorry? Um, so the question, I repeat it for the online audience. So the question was whether we use embeddings for um, the message contents or if we just use the word count. And um, while this is an interesting approach that is also on our agenda so mm -hmm. far, we only use the word count. So it is a very simple, no complex embeddings here. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, and after participants, um, yeah, anonymize the data, they have the option to review it before finally submitting it. And then after a short processing time, participants can explore interesting feedback plots to answer questions like, um, how quickly do I respond? Am I faster or slower than my chat partners? Or with whom do I chat the most? Or at which time of the day uh, am I most active, which is personally my favorite one. Um, but also um, um, you can explore whether there's changes over time in your um, chatting behavior. So all of these plots and more are part of the visualizations that our tool provides. And most of them are even interactive. Um, so if you choose to participate in our study later, these graphs will also be personalized to you. And we're also interested in a few additional things um, like demographic information and questionnaires regarding well-being. So depending on study, there are a few questionnaires and this one there are. Yeah, and with the data that is donated this way, we can gain interesting insights into social interactions. Yeah, now you might ask yourself, so there's no content in these messages. Is this metadata even useful to study social interactions? And to answer this question, we did two things. So in our data, we looked for patterns um, that are currently known from offline social interactions, and we found them. So in fact, we currently have a paper under review that shows mm -hmm. that online chat metadata is representative of offline social interactions. And what exactly these patterns are, um, I can go into that in more detail after the break, but let me break down like three main aspects here. So for one, there is reciprocity which is the notion that all the people that interact usually give about the same for a relationship. So if you have a friend that doesn't like texting, chances are you'll probably also text that friend less. And then there's burstiness, which means that we usually interact a lot in a short period of time, followed by a long period of no interaction. Um, yeah, maybe think of meeting an old friend that you haven't talked to in a while, and then you'll have a lot to catch up. You'll talk for hours until eventually you leave and you maybe not talk again until the next time you run into each other. And also there is heterogeneity, which means that everybody has a very imbalanced distribution of communication over all their relationships. So um, simply put, um, there's people that you're closer with and people that you're not that close with. Yeah, and we found all these um, patterns that are known from the literature also in our um, chat metadata. So the takeaway here is that, yes, um, the data is indeed representative of social interactions. But I also said we did another thing um, for this analysis. So in one of the previous studies, we asked people whether when they looked at their feedback graphs, um, whether they could um, see changes over time in their data. And if they could see those changes, participants were also asked if they could relate these changes to like changes in their behavior to events that were going on in their life at the time. So we didn't ask for specifics, but this could be, for example, moving to a new city or starting or ending our romantic relationship. And here's the beautiful thing. So most people in our small sample were able to see changes in the data. So this is the bar to the right. And of those people in the right bar, the darker shade indicates the number of people 
that we're also able to connect these changes um, to events in their life, which is again the majority. And for us as researchers, that's beautiful news because it means there's indeed a connection between the chat data and live events or even well-being. Okay, and so now that you've learned about, uh, you've learned more about the features of social interaction, you can use this knowledge to make sense of your own data. And as I briefly mentioned before, there are two options. You can either participate in our online study with your own data, support our research, and the study tries to connect um, interaction patterns with well-being, which you will be asked about in questionnaires. So this um, study is funded by the um, BMBF, so the Federal Ministry of Education Research, and approved by the University of Bielefeld Ethics Committee. And you will not only get like 10 euros compensation as is, as is usual for such a study, but also the personalized feedback on your chat data. Um, or if you just want to explore the general capabilities of uh, chat metadata analysis, we also provide you with some demo chat data that you can upload on a demo version of our tool. Um, so these are the two links. I think I'll take a short moment um, so that you can decide for one of the options or not decide for any of the options. Um, so you're free, your choice. Um, and then I'll go into a short demo of the uh, web page and you can all the, all the while um, feel free to ask questions. Um, yeah, in the meantime, let me say a quick word of caution on the interpretation if you choose to um, use your own data. So these plots show the quantity and the speed of interaction, but they are not an overall measure of closeness or effort that somebody puts into a relationship. So somebody texting you less than them doesn't necessarily mean that you are less important to them or they might just not like texting or have other ways of communicating. Okay, then let's get into the demo. So this is what it looks like. Um, there's again a short um, summary of what we do, what we try to achieve, why um, it might make sense for you to participate, then how it works, how the anonymization works. And then on the demo page, you have this link to download um, some, some example data that you can then use in the tool. And if you then participate, you can press start here. There again, you have the in instructions for how to get Facebook data, how to get WhatsApp data um, for different um, devices. Also, the website is available also in German, if you prefer that. Um, yeah, maybe a quick word. So I mentioned earlier that downloading Facebook or Instagram data might take quite a while. So if you plan to participate now, I think WhatsApp chats would be more useful. Um, yeah, but if you then choose to do so, there is the informed consent and I um, urge you to read it carefully. Um, for example, one point that I also want to stress now is that since the data is anonymous to us, we also don't have the option of specifically deleting your data once you uploaded it. But if you then choose to um, actually continue with the donation, it will look like this. Um, you can then upload, for example, WhatsApp data. I already have like these are the files that you can download with the link earlier on the website. Um, you can upload it. And then there is one especially important point. So to make sense of the feedback plots, um, it is important for you to remember which one of your contacts is which of the um, names that we give them. Since we don't have the names of your contacts, we have to give them some alias. And without these um, mappings, you will probably not get as much, out, uh, as, as much from the feedback. Okay, and then you can submit this data and then you can get feedback plots. Yeah, here. Um, so most of them are um, interactive. There's always uh, an explanation above with a more detailed explanation in a link in this gray box above. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the time to explore this data by yourself, but also there's more um, visualizations in case you might be interested. 
And also you have the option of downloading um, the visualization. Unfortunately, that's so far the only way of persisting this information. Um, yeah, so, and if you choose to participate in the actual study, um, you will um, have the option to continue here. There will be an additional questionnaire. And at the end, you have the option to um, sign up for a compensation, which will be like for the audience in the room, just enter some string um, come up front and tell me what you entered. I can then look up whether there's indeed such a string in the donations and then um, you can get a compensation. Or um, for the online audience, we also have the option of um, vouchers, which will um, work analogously. Okay, and this is it so far actually for um, how to participate here. So um, if you have any more questions about the donation over the about the overall process um, or something else, um, then you can ask them now. Otherwise, um, feel free to participate and um, yeah, otherwise um, I already um, leave into the break and then we can continue afterwards with, um, so I, I'll stay here, but feel free to leave and then um, we can con continue afterwards with um, some more insights, some more discussions and um, so what we gain from or like what insights we gain from this data and if any more questions come up. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Okay, <laughs> okay um, so I would um, continue now. So um, welcome back from the break. And so I hope by now you've had a chance to either look at your own data or check out what can be analyzed with the demo data. And I hope you had some interesting insights. So first of all, I'd like to know um, whether you had any questions. So was there anything about the donation process, about the visualizations, what they show, what they mean? Um, so if there are none, I would continue with um, what we'll talk about now. So um, I thought we could go a bit more into the details of um, social interaction features. So both what is um, known so far and what we found in our data and um, how this previously known stuff matches what we found. And also, I think it might be interesting to say, why are we doing this? Um, so what is the purpose of our research? And finally, if we do have some more time, um, we can also look into um, other projects of our lab. So um, let's get started with the features. So earlier I was talking about um, heterogeneity. So as a brief reminder, this means that we tend to have people that are closer to us and with whom we interact more. And then there's people that are more distant to us and we interact less with them. And then there's also something called a social signature, which is the fraction of communication that we spend on the ranks of our communication partners. So um, how much on the most contacted person relative to the second most contacted person and so on. And there's also research that showed that this signature is um, rather unique. Sorry. Jim. Uh, it's rather unique to a person and also rather stable. So social signature does not capture if two people swap ranks. So if you contact um, your contact number C um, as much as you contacted B before and the other way around. So this is not detected by the social signature. But apart from that, it is believed to be uh, stable. Um, but more recent research, um, showed that there's a few factors that influence the stability. So um, one of them would be um, personality and um, still not all the factors of variance are explained yet. So yeah, more research there is needed. But basically the takeaway here is that depending on a few factors like your personality, um, you tend to have um, more close friends and less acquaintances or just a few close friends and um, lots of less close people. And this is rather unique 
to you as a person and changes slowly, if at all. And we, um, of course, we also looked at the interaction heterogeneity in our data. And to do so, we used a tool from economics called the Gini Index. So basically, this is a metric for the inequality of a cumulative distribution. Um, so originally used to measure income inequality. And um, so if you text everybody the same amount, the cumulative distribution would just look like the straight line. And um, the more inequality there is, the more um, this Lorentz curve goes up to the um, point in the bottom. So um, this also means that for um, So for um, a value of zero, um, this would mean that everybody you text exactly the same amount, whereas one would mean that um, you text all the contacts, like you text none of your contacts except for one of them, um, and this contact uh, receives all of your attention. Um, so the Gini index, um, yeah, essentially then goes between zero and one, and Sorry, I'm a bit confused by um, my notes. Let me restart them. So, okay. <laughs> now, coming to results of our data, um, we could also observe heterogeneity there. So, um, no extreme values, so no donations where only one um, contact was texted, but medium levels of inequality, which is around what we would expect. So, since we can assume that there's people that are closer to us and people that are less close to us. But upon closer examination, we found that the average Gini index for Facebook donations is almost quite as high. So this means that there is a much more inequality in Facebook donations than in WhatsApp donations. And of course, we asked ourselves, why is that the case? So there's two fundamental differences between our WhatsApp and our Facebook donations. And um, when people donate for WhatsApp, they only donate a very limited number of chats. But at the same time, it's their most important chats. So which of the two makes a difference now? Um, to answer that question, we did the following. Um, we did not calculate the Gini index um, of a Facebook donor on all of their chats, but only on a selected subset of their chats. And we did this sampling with two strategies. So either we selected a number of chats at random. So this is to test whether it's just about the number of contacts. Or um, we sampled the top contacts of the Facebook donors. So that way we can see if heterogeneity is less extreme um, when we only look at the most important contacts. And so, of course, this assumes that the highest number of words that you send to somebody indeed indicates that this is the most important person for you. But um, now in um, this figure, each point is the mean of all donors. But for each donor, only n chats are sampled, so n on the x-axis. And the sampling is done over um, 100 times, and then the Gini index is averaged. And um, yeah, so basically, the dashed blue line is the random sampling strategy. And the solid blue line represents the top sampling strategy. And the shaded area represents the standard deviation over different donors. So for comparison, we also plotted the average Gini index for WhatsApp donations. Um, but of course, um, there we only have um, n equals 5 top chats. Um, now I think we're going to wait for Wi-Fi to come back. Okay, and there we are. So thank you for being patient. Um, so what we can see now with these sampling strategies is that both of them start off way lower if we select only a few contacts. But the um, sampling strategy of only selecting the top contacts um, is way lower in the Gini index, even lower than the WhatsApp um, 
well, donation. So the takeaway here is that random sampling already shows that the size of the personal network quite heavily influences um, the Gini index, so the notion of heterogeneity, but also the selection of different subgroups, so like the top chats has a substantial influence. So, or to put it short, um, heterogeneity depends on both the group size and what sort of group you select there. Yeah, and then, um, Related to this notion of stability, there's also different patterns. So if you think back to your childhood or your studies and the friends that you made there, with how many of them are you still friends? And do you tend to keep old friendships or are you easily making new friends and disconnecting from older, maybe? So there's two rough clusters and um, that's what's, um, they're what's called um, social explorers and social keepers. And if you look at this graph, you might be the red dot in the middle. And around you, there, um, the black dots and the gray dots are people that you um, keep in contact with. And black indicates an active connection, and gray um, means a connection that you did not con contact in a certain time frame. And so from left to right, these are snapshots that are approximately 50 days apart. And the upper row is what's called a social explorer, and um, they tend to keep very little collections, uh, connections stable over time, or, or like ex ex extended periods of time. And in the bottom row, you can see uh, social keepers, um, where there's very little of what's called uh, network turnover. Um, and another general feature of social interactions is reciprocity. So. If you think about the people that are close to you, would you say that you communicate with them the same amount that you do, um, they do with you? So while this is generally believed to be um, roughly equal, there are some exceptions, for example, family members. Uh, and due to the fact that reciprocity is very hard to determine, and um, yeah, there's, so there's very different measures for it. So. Maybe think of a romantic relationship where two people use very different ways of expressing love. So the evidence in this aspect is also not that conclusive. Um, but if you um, either participated in the study or used our tool, um, you might remember that our data collection contains word counts and that these can be used to compare how much people text each other. But you can also look at the response times, which is what we did in this um, scatter plot. So each dot is one, connect, uh, one conversation. And for each conversation, the x-axis um, indicates the fraction of messages that were answered within five minutes. And the, uh, so by, by the person donating the chat, where the y-axis indicates the fraction of messages answered within five minutes by the chat partner. So what this means is that most of the dots are on the dash diagonal um, and so both the donors and their chat partners are roughly equally fast or more precisely um, they have the same chance of responding within a five minute time frame. So um, you could say that um, in our data we can see that people put comparable effort into their uh, social relationships. So now you might wonder um, what the benefits of these research is. So um, why do we analyze this um, anonymous chat metadata for social interactions? And um, so for me, there's multiple answers um, to that. So for one, I believe that this data empowers people. So this goes more into the direction of self-awareness. So this is an objective uh, quantification of your behavior that can give you insights into aspects that you might not be aware of. Um, so for example, you might um, withdraw socially when you're stressed or whenever you chat a lot, you have a good time. Such are connections that you can draw eventually from this data. And then if you think that some of these patterns might be maladaptive or like not beneficial to you, um, you can share this data with healthcare professionals and help them help you with this objective quantification. And um, what I think is the beauty here is that this is data that is anonymous and you choose to share it. So it's not like um, this is data that will be available for you, but um, it's something that you have in your hand and also, the, the third part of this answer is 
um, more like a researcher's perspective. So this data allows for more sophisticated methods of pattern detection. So for example, machine learning to find recurring patterns over time within the same individual or between individuals and um, can maybe connect these, um, these patterns to life events that might require interventions such as social withdrawal, but also positive life events. And um, for that, I think it's just a very interesting insight. And now I want to go into the um, last part of the presentation, um, which is other work that our group does. So um, I mentioned it briefly earlier, but for example, we are working on uh, improving remote photoplatismography, which is basically the extraction from heart rate data from uh, video. Um, so the, the heart rate is, among other uh, factors, a predictor of stress. And since we're also actively involved in that research, um, this is also one of our pet projects. Um, now I want to ask um, about audio for my video. Sorry. Entschuldigung. Könnte ich jetzt tun haben, bitte? Okay, so what we've seen just now is something called the social interaction task. Um, this is another tool of ours and there people can have uh, conversations with a pre-recorded actress about different scenarios. So like a neutral scenario, something that they think is positive, like food that you love and food that you find disgusting. And um, these um, interactions, although they are um, not like, they are only simulated in the sense that um, it is a pre-recorded actress that you are talking with. Um, you still exhibit the same social signals as in a regular conversation. And this helps in um, detecting, um, well, or, so let's say these analysis, they, they are helpful in supporting diagnosis for psychological conditions that um, are related to um, social interactions. So, for example, social anxiety or autism spectrum disorder. And what we can see in the video um, was that on the bottom we have um, like the, the voice features or an analysis of the voice, whereas um, the plots above the actress show um, the activation of different parts of muscles um, in the face of a person. So all of these are features that can be analyzed from the video together with the gaze data that you saw in the overlay of the child. Um, and all of the, these are um, very much predictive of certain social conditions. Okay, and another project. Wait, no. Like this. Yeah, and um, we use basically the same features in the analysis of stress. So um, we want to see uh, what the effects of stress are on the voice, on your facial um, gestures. And also, um, so this is also one of our active research projects. And uh, Okay, and actually, um, so this this is it. Um, I didn't bring any more projects, <laughs> but um, you are now free to ask questions if there's anything more you'd like to learn about um, social interactions, if you have questions about the ongoing study, if um, there's any form of other questions. Otherwise, I uh, um, thank you for um, the time that you um, brought and your attention. I hope you found, found something interesting here. And thank you for participating. Sure. Ah, 
Uh, yeah, so um, the question was whether people that basically don't get social cues well, whether they understand um, that they should talk in the, in, in the sequence when the actress doesn't talk. And so, yes, the people are um, introduced to the study with like, what is the purpose and how does it work? And they are also told, so there's sequences where the actress talks and then sequences um, where you should talk. So um, at least so far, to my knowledge, it worked well um, with this, um, well, pre-explanation. Any other questions about the online audience? Okay, cool. One more question, yeah? Sorry, um, what could you? <laughs> so um, that's actually a very good question. And this is like one of the main parts of my PhD. Um, which methods are suitable for analyzing um, this, this data. So what we, um, what we are most interested in is finding um, patterns that are like recurring over time. And um, for that, some methods that work without us telling them what we, um, what we want there. So un unsupervised methods. Um, would be our means of uh, like the, the methods of choice, but even there, there's a lot of different methods, and we didn't like quite decide on something that works. Um, so clustering um, in different um, well, different types of clusterings are um, something that we started with, but so far there's no um, definite method where I would say, okay, this is what we will use and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tried out uh, different methods, but so far I haven't found anything where I say um, this this is the best to analyze this. So if, if this is uh, something um, that you're uh, familiar with, then um, I'd be happy to have a talk uh, later on um, if you have um, some suggestions there. Okay, cool. Then thank you. now. Thank you for your time.